Hello, welcome to the Thursday, March 8th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The amount of ransomware we have seen lately has certainly declined and Pratt also states in his last post that this is a trend that he's observing as well. But nevertheless, they're still out there and earlier this week he came across two updated samples that he's discussing in his latest post. The two samples that Pratt found follow the very sort of standard pattern of arriving as a word attachment in email. Then they trick the user into enabling macros, which then results in a PowerShell script downloading additional malicious files. In order to trick the user into enabling macros, these Word documents will display a message that tells the user that the document was created in an earlier version of Word. And then they tell them, well, uh, you can still look at a document, but you first have to enable editing and enable content, which uh, then is exactly what enables macros. As usual, Pratt provides all the indicators of compromise and packet captures and the like that allow you to sort of test your own defenses, but hopefully you are already defended against this kind of infection because uh, if it's not crypto ransomware, they're probably trying to find something else to install on your systems using these simple word macros. And talking about crypto ransomware, Malwarebytes has a nice blog post showing how to break some encryption algorithms. Of course, if the encryption algorithm is done well, there may not be really a way to break the algorithm, but quite often in past versions of crypto ransomware, the author made some sort of basic mistakes in how the encryption was implemented, how keys were selected, or which exact algorithm was selected. So this blog post gives you a little bit of an insight in how to possibly defeat these weak or badly implemented encryption systems. And McAfee has a blog post looking in more detail at a recent flash exploit. If you remember earlier this year, we had sort of this flash zero day that the Korean CERT discovered by actually spotting malware in the wild, exploiting the vulnerability. Well, uh, McAfee now looked at how this particular exploit did manage to bypass some of the protection me mechanism that Adobe added to flash in recent years. Haven't really seen a lot of flash exploits lately and McAfee also kind of uh, confirms that. Now, according to the blog post, this may be due to these improved protection mechanisms, but it could also be due to the smaller and smaller install base of Adobe Flash. And recently, Iceland has become the hot country for crypto coin mining in part because it offers very cheap power. Well, uh, with uh, the money, the crooks moved as well. And recently, hundreds of Bitcoin mining servers were stolen out of a data center. Now, Bitcoin miners essentially are specialized servers that include specific hardware components that make them ideal to mine Bitcoin. With the increase in value of Bitcoins, these kind of specialized components have become a hot and sometimes hard to come by commodity. So that's probably the motivation here that they did actually steal the equipment to then either resell these servers or resell components. Now, data centers, of course, are usually being thought of as rather secure and they don't really go into a lot of details in how they actually manage to steal that many devices. But one hint is that one of the security guards was arrested and they also arrested a number of other people that they suspect are part of this gang. 
And German researcher Mike Kuketz uh, took a closer look at some Android email apps and uh, found out that a number of them are sending your email username and password back to the developer. In one particular case, Blue Mail, the developer actually announced an update and stated that as part of the update, this particular application will no longer send passwords back to the server. But according to Mike's research, well, it's still sending the password back to the developer's servers. This is often done sort of because of a poorly implemented kind of authentication scheme, where instead of doing the proper thing and using schemes like OAuth and such, the developer actually does route emails through the particular developer's server. So you're sending basically post requests to the server, then requesting your emails and the developer's web server is actually then logging into your email account. That's of course not how an email client should be implemented. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.